Good afternoon and, and welcome. My name is Robert Dijkgraaf. I'm the director here at the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's a great uh, pleasure to have uh, you all here in remembrance, but also in celebration of our dear friend and colleague, Irving Leven, professor at the Institute School of Historical Studies for 45 years. Now, many of you were here this morning when there were reflections on Irving's scholarly work and his contributions to art history. And I'm also happy to see others here now joining for this event. It's truly heartening to see all of you here gathering, in particular, of course, Irving's family, friends, and colleagues. And I would like, in particular, of course, to acknowledge Marilyn and uh, his wife for 66 years. It's amazing. And the daughters, Amelia and Sylvia, and Sylvia's husband, Greg. Shortly, we'll hear from some of you who spoke also this morning with others, and you will share your stories uh, about Irving and how his life touched you. For Pia, my wife Pia and me, uh, we had a, a serious case of imprinting because I think actually Irving was the first person we met when uh, on the first, our very first day here on campus. And uh, with his big beaming smile, uh, declaring that he was uh, our greatest fan. And, uh, and that felt like that, actually. But talking about greatest fans, I think uh, can't think of a better example than Irving and Marilyn, how they've been cheering each other on. Uh, um, wonderful memories of the two of you sitting together in your office at home. And uh, I think we all agree today that Irving was a great gift to art history, to the world, and certainly to the Institute but how wonderfully that he brought us that other gift, Marilyn. Uh, I'm particularly dear her, one of your latest collaborations, which was this wonderful book about the seal of the Institute, Truth and Beauty, capturing the essence of the Institute, and somehow explaining that when Abraham Flexner set up this institution, the first thing he did was not build a building, recruit faculty, or anything practical, but commissioned an artist to make an image that captured the essence of this institution. Uh, and then somehow, uh, art always precedes everything. That's what, what they made clear. Now, I've decided not to read Irving's CV, um, although I must say there are little juicy bits in it. Uh, if your life starts by an, with an invitation of Bertrand Russell, I think you have a very much a good start. And um, if you win prizes so many times that they change the rules, that's also a good thing. Uh, but just to see this magnificent stretch uh, of intellectual curiosity and impact, ranging from late antiquity to Frank Gehry, who's here with us. I think it's uh, Irving's career curved as beautifully as the arches of his beloved sculptor, Bernini. Since 1973, when Irving was appointed as professor in the S Institute School of Historical Studies, he was an essential influence and beloved member of our community, with whom he generously shared his insights. In 2016, he expressed his view of the Institute with these words, and I'm very happy we're able to capture this on camera because it's the best, uh, I would say, uh, way to uh, uh, capture the Institute in a few words. Irving said, to this day, I'm in wonder of it. I'm stunned by this place. It still seems to me one of the most exciting ideas in the history of humankind. That's a lot to say. And indeed, from somebody with such a grasp of human history. As I said, he played an essential role in the development of the Institute's School of Historical Studies. With fellow professor in the school, John Elliott, he worked to make the school more cohesive in the 1970s with a focus on actively encouraging the appointments of younger members. As Elliott recalled, Irving viewed the Institute as an international center with an international message, as a place of refuge for younger people to get on with their work as visiting members. In terms of his career, Irving's legacy as an art historian is well documented, from his discovery of the earliest marble portrait bust made by the young prodigy Bernini to an expansive knowledge of Italian art and culture based on 50 years of study. Yet, we have gathered here to remember Irving the man, the scholar, the husband, the father, the mentor, the friend. One of the wonderful things of life at the Institute, and I think Irvin was really the embodiment of that, is that life and work entangle in such a close knit that they are inseparable. And I noticed this, that Irving 
as well as Maryland. And whenever we have something here, an event, a party, a lecture, they're always attending. And it reminded me, there's a wonderful inter interview with Leonard Bernstein, and he goes on rambling, and at the very end said, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> but I know the answer is yes. <laughs> so adding to his many distinctions, Irving will be named, as you can read here, and in Italian, it sounds all, everything sounds better, a na will named a Knight of the Order of the Star of Italy at an induction ceremony to, to, to take place at the Italian Embassy in Washington, D.C. on June the 3rd. This globally recognized honor is conferred by the President of the Italian Republic, recognizing exemplary merit in the cultivation of friendly international ties with Italy and the promotion of international in Italian culture. I think an absolutely lovely image, Irving as a knight of the stars, beaming in the heavenly sky, undoubtedly among his beloved artists. Irving exemplified the characteristic of a world-leaning scholar and humanist, and the Institute community in its full breadth was enriched immensely by his presence, his insights, his laughter, and his dear friendship. He's greatly missed here and around the world. Now, the program will be very simple. We have a number of uh, uh, prepared remarks, and you see the names in your, in your program. I will just ask the speakers to briefly just say their names. Their reputations are all well known. And after the prepared remarks, uh, I'll be back on stage, and there will be an opportunity for uh, some of you, if you want, to also share your improvised remarks. So very happy to first break my own rule and welcome architect Phyllis Lambert as the first speaker. No one was more fun, more generous, more interested in students, and in ideas and rigor more generous to me, especially intellectually, teasingly, sharply. I met Irving in 1970s, in the middle of the 70s. He came here in 73, so it couldn't have been much later, when Richard Krautheimer, whom we both revered, uh, was giving a lecture here. And I think that's when I first met him. And afterwards, we, we actually, I remember our first discussion was about theater because I had just designed a book building in Montreal uh, in honor of my mother, and it had a wonderful sort of seating shell theater in it. So that was a wonderful conversation. Conversations with Irving, as you know, were always wonderful. <coughs> and then our, we passed, we, our, our relationships grew with the Canadian Center for Architecture, a new kind of uh, institution that is concerned with, well, I guess uh, architecture is a public concern, but with scholarship and with making people understand the ideas of architecture. And we created a study center there and a research center. And Irving was the first um, sort of head of the, the, the so he set it up. We were talking about, he didn't set it up, he was the, sort of the chair of setting it up. and. The, the research center uh, didn't start for a couple of years, but we were planning how to, how to make it work. And one of the things he uh, discussed was, of course, that you have to have a very good place to have tea so that everybody can meet and, and interact. And then, of course, he, he was on the, as I said, he was on the board for quite a few years of, of the place. And then, of course, I got firsthand uh, information about what study, how a study center works, because he arranged to have me as the director's uh, 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 visitor here at the IAS in the spring term of 1986, which was, of course, a great joy. I brought my dog with me. It was wonderful. Um, yes, and then, of course, we of course, I got to New Maryland at that time, and then we all traveled together many times in Italy. Uh, we, we spent time in Milan. We st spent time in, in, in Padona, where Irving, we went to uh, various uh, cities r around. We went to um, Prato, to Pistoia, to Pisa, 
and Irving was always looking for that house he was going to 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 uh, to buy to a, a villa that he was going to have. Of course, the villa was in uh, Cape Cape May, and for many many <laughs> summers and. Uh, times out there it was glorious with Irving and Amelia and sometimes Sylvia and of course Marilyn. Um, I'm almost at the end of my notes. The Stilt House, Max Ball it was called. And then we went to, you know, his curiosity was so extraordinary and it, it ranged so broadly and we went to visit uh, industrial site in Pennsylvania, and there was a place called, um, I think maybe it was the name of the, of the book, Utopia, a Jewish community in southern uh, New Jersey. Fascinating. And then we also went earlier to a Russian community. But he was always looking for new, not for new things, for, 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 for how humans uh, related to, to, the, to, 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 to ideas and to what they did. And then, of course, we talked always in these times of architecture and art. And from the, the thing about his writing was so, also, I mean, we talked and talked and talked, and there were always these connections. And the way he would start about one idea, and it would be a central issue. And he would, there would be so many issues brought in from all over. And this is the way he wrote, too, which is extraordinary. And I had a little piece I wanted to read, but I forgot the document I was going to read from. But his description of, of the uh, Bernini's trit Triton f uh, f um, <clears throat> um, fountain in, in, in Rome, it's so absolutely delicious the way he talks about how they, they throw out the water and swallow it up. And it just, I, I wish I had it, but I don't have it. So <clears throat> just believe me, this is fantastic. I have so much to thank Irving for, for his generosity, for, for being such fun. I don't know anybody who was so wonderful to be with, and for his encouragement of me and of everyone, and for Marilyn, and for Amelia, and for Sylvia, who the apple doesn't fall far, far from the tree, and Sylvia is the most glorious, the most interesting, the most intelligent, and the most respected member of the board of the Canadian Centre for Architecture. And the last time I saw Irving, he was there with Marilyn at the opening, it was just about six months ago, I think, maybe it was a little longer, of an exhibition that Sylvia had done. And with that, Irving, I loved you. I love you still. Thank you. I'm Charles Scribner, and when I returned to Princeton in the fall of 1973 as a new grad student, I met Irving Levin, who had himself just arrived here from New York with Marilyn, Amelia, and Sylvia. That encounter was to pay the richest of dividends over the next four and a half decades. Irving was quite simply the most brilliant scholar I've been blessed to know this side of paradise. He modeled concepts, insights, and language as miraculously as Bernini-shaped marble. The highlight of that first term back was Irving's packed lecture on divine illumination in Caravaggio's two St. Matthews, followed by his colloquium for our group of starry-eyed grad students. Well, in my eyes, Irving embodied divine illumination as he mentored, challenged, encouraged, probed, chastised, and utterly engaged me on the road to Emmaus, the subject of an article that emerged from it. His first book, Bernini and the Crossing of St. Peter's, transfigured my vision of art history. His dazzling methodology was matched by linguistic magic. I'll never forget his description of Bernini's Baldacchino as topographic transfusion, Jerusalem to Rome. Years later, he inspired me to lobby Abrams to add the first book on a sculptor to their Masters of Art series. Well, you can guess the identity of the sculptor. 
Fast forward to the new millennium and the discovery of Bernini's last and long lost sculpture, the Salvator Mundi in Rome. I called Irving and asked whether it had been painful to revise his earlier attribution in favor of this new bust. His response, that's the way the cookie crumbles. I cannot think of a more treasured collection of writings on a great artist than Irving's three volume magnum opus on Bernini, Visible Spirit. That title equally describes its author of prose so spirited, engaging, persuasive, and more durable than bronze. On Bernini's 400th anniversary, Irving called his scholarly devotion to him a long love affair, but it was surpassed by a more visible one. For together, and that's how I shall always see them, Marilyn and Irving represented the Lunts or the Curies of art history. <laughs> Luminaries and luminous. A few years ago, I finally met my favorite living artist, Frank Stella. What did he want to talk about? His dear friends, Marilyn and Irving. <laughs> Irving then emailed me his encomium entitled, Frank Stella Talks Too Much. <laughs> okay, I'm taking my cue. When I look back and all around at the department chairs, the teachers, professors, curators, and scholars Irving has inspired and modeled like Bernini terracottas, I'm reminded of what Henry Adams said about a teacher never knowing where his influence ends. A teacher, Adams wrote, affects eternity. I'm Nicola Courtright. Thank you so much. I got to know Irving when I was an, a naive and I'm afraid discontented graduate student at the Institute of Fine Arts. My then boyfriend David and his friend Jack, working on their dissertations with Irving, had urged me to take a class with him and, and experience an approach to the study of art history that they found profound and exciting. I followed their advice and took the train to Princeton every week to join Irving's course on the drawings of Bernini from Leipzig, which would lead to an exhibition at the Princeton Museum. The catalog, written almost entirely by us graduate students in the seminar, was the fruit of Irving's remarkable pedagogy. I had never met a professor who did not tell his students what to think about a subject he or she was renowned for. In fact, quite the opposite. But in the classroom, Irving would simply never hold forth. Instead, when one of us posited a, a, a hypothesis about why a drawing looked the particular way it did, or suggested what relationship it had to the finished product, he would rub his chin and not meeting our glances, slide his eyes to either side of the room before formulating a lapidary, probing question about the utterance. There was plenty of discussion back and forth, but he provided no so-called answer, and those questions remained irritants and challenges that I loved. It was my first encounter with the Laven version of the Socratic method. When I decided to switch fields and write my dissertation on a monument in the Vatican with him, he continued this manner of exchange over my thesis drafts. In doing so, his thinking machine always focused on the fundamentals rather than the dross. This pedagogical method also encouraged me to make my own particular way into difficult material, and then I found it belonged to me. Further, his scholarly example emboldened me to take deep intellectual dives make connections between varied fields, and trust my instinct when I found affiliations that might seem unlikely at first. A large share of my intellectual encounters came about from the very beginning through Irving and Marilyn's invitation into their home and lives. There I encountered firsthand the intense ecosystem of two intertwined beings who were continually, vocally, intellectually curious. They did not hold back in discussion there. Since Irving believed that the primary job of the art historian was to explore and explain visual phenomena, and that every, every product of humankind was artful, there was never a shortage of material to investigate, wonder about, or argue over, sometimes ferociously. 
For to Irving, the practice of art history was never trivial, abstract, or academic. It was always very personal. It affected him on a forcefully visceral level more than it does anyone else I know. So Marilyn, I'm glad I can be here in order to thank you too for your part in shaping my life. Thank you so much. Hello all, Marilyn, Sylvia, Amelia, friends. Imagine this, September 1972, registration day at the Institute of Fine Arts. <laughs> During a conference with an advisor on course selection, Irving Lehman burst into the room, radiating energy, just as we see him in this superb photograph announcing today's gathering. We discussed a paper I had written as an undergraduate at Hunter College on Bernini's early statue of Aeneas fleeing Troy. I was quite proud of that fledgling effort and hoped that he would improve. But none of that. No stroking of the ego, no small talk, uh, no chatter. The important thing I recall him saying is that you pushed on the material. I took that as permission and began a lifelong project to examine the meaning of works of art, fortified by the belief that with enough hard work and a dash of inspiration, they would yield up their intellectual treasures just as they did for Irving. Irving was the ideal guide. Like Bernini's robust Aeneas who carries the art historical tradition on his back, the aged Anchises in the statue, if you um, can picture it, and with the infant Ascanius cradling the sacred flame marching toward the future and Rome. Marilyn and Irving welcome me to their hearth. Irving demanding that I think through art historical problems on my own. Marilyn finishing up the proofs for her massive tome on the Barberini inventories of art and Sylvia and Amelia under my watch in Rome for a few days when mom and dad were called away to Tunisia, as I recall, but in truth looking after me, a first-time traveler with no Italian. <laughs> Irving's, Irving's scholarly contributions to our discipline are remarkable, not the least because of their range in time and place from late antique Antioch to the here and now. But the city of Rome provided his lifelong passion And in time, it became mine, a kind of collateral gift he gave to me. Each year, <clears throat> we would meet in Italy to continue our conversation, usually at the American Academy in Rome, where the Laban Operations Room was set up in the library apartment at the hub of the Palazzo. <laughs> Twin desks overflowing with scholarly paraphernalia and electric fans rigged up to dispel the summer heat. I puzzled over why they didn't offer a more tranquil off-site accommodation and I saw, until I saw how much Irving relished contact with the denizens of the academy, historians, philologists, archaeologists, and of course artists and architects, debating ideas, presenting his own point of view, at times with unnerving intensity. And not only were scholars and artists from the U.S. in Irving sites, being in Italy with Irving <coughs> and Marilyn felt like a celebration. Italian colleagues seemed to materialize at every turn. Many had been friends for decades, but studiosi appeared as well, eager to make contact, to share something new. In 1983, Irving first published a piece with the evocative title, The Art of Art History, setting out the ground rules that guided his work as an art historian, and I spoke a little bit about that this morning. He referred to the light bulb effect, intellectual illumination that switched on for him when works of art are treated as fully articulate conceptual statements possessing all the richness of a trattato. In the same piece, he touched on his personal goal to transmit that illumination to others. So I think he should have the last word here, and I quote, I do not pretend that my own work has ever met the criteria in, implicit in my, any of my assumptions yet they are much more to me than philosophical abstractions. They represent the obscure but persistent demons that prod me to think about a work in the first place. They are what drive me from the work itself into archives, libraries, and classrooms in the hope of coaxing my own filament to conduct. Thank you. In the spring of 1975, Irving Laven invited me to the Institute to chat about a dissertation topic that I'd been considering. I was then a 23-year-old graduate student at the university, 
eager to find a mentor who would both share my enthusiasms and inspire me. Sitting in Irving's office that day, I realized that I had found that person. Here was a man at the top of his game, a brilliant thinker, overflowing with vitality, who regarded the study of art history to be an activity of utmost consequence, an intellectual pursuit that had the power to bring us closer to understanding art at its deepest level and to unlock the intricacies of human history in the process. He impressed me. Moreover, he liked my project. The fact that it involved the study of little dark pictures representing nobodies doing nothing did not dampen his enthusiasm. <laughs> In fact, it increased it. He thought those pictures worthy of study, not despite of, but because of their seemingly ignoble qualities. And for reasons that I could then only dimly perceive, he regarded my project as important. After that initial meeting, there was no turning back. As my dissertation advisor, Irving challenged and encouraged me at every turn, altering fundamentally my mind and life in the process. Normally, we would meet after dinner in his comfortable home on Maxwell Lane. Marilyn, and occasionally Amelia and Sylvia, were on hand to greet me when I arrived. Marilyn graciously attempted to put me at ease, conversing with me about anything she thought might do so from her recent research to the proper way to clean mushrooms. <laughs> Eventually, Irving appeared and family members drifted away. What came next, I'm tempted to describe as a methodical course of brain cell transplants conducted without anesthesia. There would be a topic, normally a painting or subject that I was struggling to understand. I would tell Irving my way of thinking about it. He would listen patiently. Then he would begin to talk with great animation and passion about issues regarding art and thought that bore no relevance whatsoever to the matter at hand. Or so I thought at the time. I listened attentively, my brows knit, my head bobbing, uttering the syllable, hmm, while wondering what was going on. Had Irving forgotten the topic of my research? Was he perhaps confusing me with someone else? I would leave Maxwell Lane electrified intellectually, but also deeply perplexed. And I would main, remain perplexed for days, weeks, even months, until at some random seeming moment, while toiling away on my project, a new level of understanding would come upon me, and I would have the urge to shout, Ah, that's what Irving meant. It was as though some massive rewiring job had finally been completed in my head and the switch thrown. Irving and I replayed that scenario repeatedly throughout the years, right up until recent times. During my unforgettable sessions with him, Irving shared with me his deep understanding of traditions of thought that proved to be of great consequence to my work then and have shaped my thinking about 17th century art ever since. Socratic irony, the Renaissance tradition of paradox, serio ludere, burlesco, conceptismo, to name just but a few. Of even greater consequence, he instilled in me, <laughs> he instilled in me general principles of art historical inquiry that I imagine he understood to govern his own intellectual explorations. At the risk of misrepresenting Irving's thoughts, I will try to characterize three of them. One, art, all art, is generated by ideas. The primary task of the art historian is to excavate and reassemble those ideas and to demonstrate their realization in the physical product, the work of art. As a graduate student, I once asked Irving whether the idea that he sought dwelled in the artist's conscious mind, or whether it was lodged someplace deeper down. He paused as if considering the, fresh, the question afresh, and then replied, it didn't really matter. We don't have the artist's brain to study, he said. We only have the work of art. 
too. O oh, art historian, never underestimate the thinking capacity of artists. Doing so will assure your confinement in darkness forever. I don't know of anyone who had a higher regard for the intellectual capacity of artists than Irving Levin. It was not just Bernini whom Irving thought had un gran cervello. It was the lot of them. His message to art historians was, if you are not illuminated by a particular work of art, don't blame the artist. Go away and think harder until you get it. That attitude was, I think, one of Irving's most potent secrets of success. It led him to keep going in deeper mentally where others stopped short of that goal. Three, consider as evidence every aspect and facet of the work of art that you are trying to illuminate, however seemingly unimportant. No iconographical or stylistic feature is without significance. Indeed, the most inconsequential seeming aspects of images and objects often prove to be the most momentous. Sigmund Freud taught us that, for the human mind, the trivial is anything but trivial. Irving Levin taught us, with far more consistency and success than Freud himself, that truth in art lies in features that may appear inconsequential, inconsequential or merely a matter of the artist's style. As many in this room are aware, Irving could be a stern taskmaster. In the process of getting things done, he made demands on those around him that could feel capricious and unreasonable. On occasion, he grew impatient with those who did not see things his way or did not meet his expectations. The razor sharpness of his vision made it difficult for him to accept nearsightedness in others. As I was in the final stages of completing my doctoral dissertation, a process that seemed to last forever, Irving insisted on my adding an additional chapter at the end. It was something that we had discussed early on, but at this late stage, with life breathing down my neck, I didn't want to do it. I thought reason on my side. Irving saw otherwise. Unable to convince me in any other way, he finally said in exasperation, add the chapter because I say to add it. If you don't, you can find someone else to sign your dissertation. That bitter medicine caught me by surprise. I swallowed it. In time, I came to see the wisdom of adding that chapter. Irving could be as generous as he was demanding. How freely he gave me his time, how eagerly he engaged with me on nearly every topic, on the deepest level, sharing his ideas and passion for thought cannot be exaggerated. He was also unyieldingly supportive when he deemed the cause worthy. Years ago, I asked Irving to recommend me for some grant. Our ensuing conversation touched upon the number of pages that I had published relative to my peers, a tender subject. Irving shook his head and uttered, I am slow. You are extremely slow. <laughs> then he went to bat for me, as he had done many times before. Irving entrusted me with his powerful, unique vision of how art works. This was a great gift, but by no means his only one. Owing to him, I have enjoyed a deep friendship for the past 44 years with Marilyn, a person whose intellect and example has guided me as much as anyone alive. Irving enabled friendships of equal duration and warmth with Amelia and Sylvia, my sisters from another mother, as Amelia likes to say. He introduced me to scholars by the hundreds, none of whom have been more important to me than his own friends, disciples, and students. We form a tight band, our shared experiences and Irving inculcated principles forever binding us. 
Irving's influence helped me to win prestigious grants and awards, including a fellowship at the American Academy in Rome, a visitorship at the Institute, and more recently, a university professorship at my own institution. Of Irving Laven's luminous life and work, I am a chief beneficiary. I will always be immensely grateful for all that he did for me personally, for helping me to become the scholar, teacher, and person that I am, as I will for his majestic, ennobling contributions to our academic discipline. Thank you. Um, I'm, I am uh, Irving and Marilyn's son-in-law, and when I was a graduate student next door at Princeton University School of Architecture, I had the chance to meet a lot of great art historians and architectural historians. Um, uh, by the way, what I'm going to say, it's not about anybody in this room. Um, but, but they were there to deploy history as a precedent to be digested and used by architects or they were there to explain or justify the work of, of architects. And I remember I met Irving at somebody's cottage on a Sunday afternoon, um, ironically before I met my wife, Sylvia, I met Irving, and he was there and asked what was going on. I told him I was using a computer and I was interested in curves and I was a big Borromini fan of Quattrofontana. And he was so intellectually curious for half an hour, he grilled me about how I was using the computer and telling me that actually Bernini would be the one that would like the computer, not Borromini. Um, and what he did was he taught history as a spirit and as a spirit that was in the present and he was very curious about the present and wanted to make history a thing that was alive and had a continuity and a connection. And that was, for me, what was so special about him, is, is he wasn't giving me a precedent to use, he was giving me a spirit to embody. Um, it, it's very, it's impossible for me to talk about Irving without talking about Marilyn, because within a month of meeting Irving, I met, or within a month before I met Irving, I'd actually met Marilyn. And Somebody said, you know, there's an art historian working on Piero that's got a silicon graphics computer somewhere on campus. And I said, that's impossible. There's a silicon graphics computer in New Jersey. And I found out <laughs> it was Marilyn who was doing her work on Piero with a computer. It was incredible to me um, that, that it was in art history and not in computer science or something like that. And, and frankly, I then came to realize that Irving and Marilyn were this organism of intellectual curiosity that just moved through the most interesting places. And you've already heard, you know, from Frank Gehry to Frank Stella, they were just so excited about what was going on and making what they knew relevant for today. Um, so then I, I have to say very, not as an aside, but after meeting Marilyn, meeting Irving, I then met my wife, Sylvia. Um, <laughs> who said you gotta meet Frank. <laughs> and so all of these connections I think are what's important and if, if it wasn't for Irving and Marilyn and Sylvia, I never would have had a sailing buddy, Frank. So thank you, Irving. <laughs> That's it? That's it, that's all I got. So before he met Sylvia, um, I, Berta and I traveled with uh, the Lavens occasionally. We were very fortunate to um, do a few trips. And on one of those trips, <clears throat> they asked me if I knew this guy, Greg Lynn. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> and where'd he go? I'm behind you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think I did know you. Didn't We'd met. Yeah. We met I, through I, a guy we won't talk about. Yeah, OK. So. I said, thumbs up, let's go. <laughs> and next thing I know, Sylvia and he are a couple. Um, Irving met me, or I met him, when I was doing the, um, there was a thing in, in Stradiv Stradivissima Nova. In the, the uh, Novo Stradivissima. Strada Novissima. At the Biennale, and uh, uh, 
I was sort of a real outsider to the, that architectural group. And uh, by some stupid quirk of circumstance, Domus put my picture on the cover of their magazine. It was that week. I arrived at, at, for this event and was given a wall of, between two columns in the Corderia to make some kind of a gesture. And all of the architects were just full bore on postmodernism. So everybody was making references to Greece and whatever. And it was discouraging. <laughs> and I took, I don't know why, I took some wood, two by fours, and I did a drawing in one plane in, in between the columns and a, and, and, uh, a perspective a drawing that led to a window in the back wall. And so it was very thin and, and I was, uh, laughed at by all my brethren who said, ha, 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 that's anything. And uh, I, was, I was insecure, so I was nervous about it all at that time. But there wasn't much I could do about it. Along comes Professor Levin somehow, somewhere in this mix, and falls, tells me what a great thing it is that I did. And all of a sudden, I was relevant. <laughs> Uh, at least I felt good. <laughs> um, from there, uh, Berta and I met. You, we can't talk about Irving without Marilyn. Uh, we spent time with the Levens, and I found out about uh, her studies of Piero, which I was interested in, and uh, she gave me her book on the flagellation, which I cherish as one of the greatest, I think, one of the greatest art, art uh, books I've ever read. Uh, I still love it. <laughs> um, Irving would call me out of the blue about Bernini. He would see my stuff and, and see a drawing, see a model, come, come by the office, call me and ask what I'm doing. Uh, I don't know how, we, I don't remember how we communicated it, about it, but occasionally he would see stuff and would uh, tell me about how it related to the architectural history that he was studying. And that also connected me and, and uh, I loved that, I loved that connection, I love that support, that talk, that talk, it opened my mind to a lot of things. Um, when Bilbao opened, the Lavens came and we decided to go on a little trip afterwards to, I, I was interested in 1959, I lived in France, got interested in Romanesque churches and Oton and and Giselbertus and all of that stuff. And uh, so they said their, one of their best friends was a guy named Horst Bredekamp, who was an expert in all that. They would invite him and we would go on this trip together. And we traveled from, uh, from Bilbao going east on the highway to visit Romanesque churches together. And every night we would stop somewhere for dinner and the discussions would end in great arguments about which arguments about whether it was 1847 or 1848 <laughs> between Marilyn and Irving, which was very exciting. <laughs> and um, they got down to months occasionally. <laughs> And uh, Horst, of course, knew all the, the sculpture and explained all of it to us, and we had a great time doing that. But Irving opened the door to, to a lot of things. One of them was a trip to uh, Dijon to visit Klaus Schluter. The, uh, by, 
didn't know much about Klaus Schluter, uh, probably nothing. <laughs> and uh, they took me to the, the insane asylum where Klaus Schluter has a fountain and he has the, the uh, sculpture of Moses and they showed me the, the um, uh, what do you call those guys? Plurence. <laughs> Huh? Voila. And uh, that made a big uh, impression on me. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I think Horst is going to say something about that. He warned me. I think I copied it. <laughs> um, I, I don't remember. I think I called. Greg and said, has Irving called you yet about water? Because yeah. <laughs> Irving called me one day and said, started yelling through the phone about water and about Leonardo and water and the, the uh, turbulence and, the chaos, and then it ends up in chaos and it, he just went on and on and on and I, it, I so loved that and, and felt it and got emotional about it myself and and looked it all up and, and did my own research but uh, he was like that he would out of the blue say something uh, and and whenever when I was teaching at Yale I would always call him for a jury and he came and uh, Usually I had artists on the jury. I had Klaus Oldenburg and Frank Stella and Richard Serra and whatever, and he loved those guys and, and, uh, and got all excited and participated in the architectural juries at Yale. And uh, damn it, I there's so much to talk about this guy. One of the trips, we went to San Marie de la Mer, to the fe and it was the date of the festival. <laughs> and we all worked together and we went to a restaurant and had, were having dinner and we looked around and, Ir and Irving was gone. He was wearing a little beret, I remember. He was very French that week. <laughs> And we wandered, I wandered off, or some of, some of us wandered off to try and find him. We found him a few hundred yards down the street dancing with the gypsies. <laughs> he was rolling around and doing this stuff, and I guess he'd had a few drinks. <laughs> we, had to, we had to corral him and bring him back. We, found, we lost him in Mayan temples and all over the world. Yeah. So, what else? I'm, I'm gonna miss him. Me too. We got her? We got a lot. <laughs> yeah, we, we got, got all lot. kinds of later. Okay. My name is uh, Horst Bredekamp. I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, I thought that we were asked also to show slides in the afternoon. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, well, that gives me the occasion to comment on some of the sentences Frank Rust uh, brought forward. I met Irving uh, on several occasions in the 1970s and 80s congresses of the Comité International d'Histoire de l'Art and of the CAA. We discussed, but we had no real personal context, contact. Our first personal one came in the 1980s by chance, during a break of one of my PhD colleagues in Hamburg. I stepped out on the balcony that goes to the Rota Baum uh, Street you see here, where by chance I uh, spotted him walking by. He was in town because of a symposium. I think it was on the Bernini bust, which he identified in the depot of the Hamburger Kunsthalle. That's why he is, uh, and, um, has a transhistorical name in, in Hamburg, only because of this, not this alone. 
So I saw him walking by. I called his name, he saw me, and out of an intuition, half jokingly, I asked him if he'd like to participate. And then the unexpected happened. He came up in the second floor and got acquainted with every single one of the 15 PhD candidates. When we sat down, he tried to repeat their names one after the other. This was as remarkable as the discussion after the first talk. He gave his opinion on the presentation like a long-time member of our group. His enthusiasm about the young people won everybody over. And afterwards, we went for a drink, and that was the beginning of our uh, friendship. At that time, the ongoing discussions about the future of the Warburg House in the Heilwegstraße um, had come to a climax. The site of the Kulturwissenschaftliche Bibliothek Warburg had been sold after the war, and all attempts to get it into public hands had been in vain. My colleague Martin Warnke uh, and uh, I myself were more or less desperate, and we thought it might be a good idea to have lunch on this with the Senator of Culture, Ingo von Münch, and Irving in order to present not only the London wing of those who went into exile in 1933, but also the American one, which is connected forever with Erwin Panofsky, uh, who founded the historical studies here at this uh, institute. So we asked Irving um, as his successor, and he, uh, in, in a second, he agreed to come. In a certain moment, during our discussions, he raised his voice in a, in a way that nobody will forget who participated, and the senator told me that one week ago. He remembered that still, and shocked the senator by vigorously declaring the, historical, the historic obligation of Germany and Hamburg to make this happen and buy this house back into public hand. Into the silence that followed, the deeply impressed senator responded, as a sign of my engagement, I will provide Bredekamp the money to host an international conference on Abi Warburg in order to make things happen. What followed became the uh, first uh, large conference on Warburg uh, caused by a kind of eruption of Irving. The papers of the conference went into a publication that documented the first internal, international discussion of our Bergian methodology after the 1930s. During one of the breaks, a picture was taken on which one can see, for example, uh, here, uh, Peter Burke, and yeah, that's me, and behind me, supporting me, Marilyn and um, Irving. Present on the final photo is, for example, also, where is he, Kurt, Kurt Forster, and uh, Salvatore Zetis, who then became his, one of his successors at the Getty um, Institute. This uh, conference was like a storage battery of our relations that never lost its uh, power. Yeah, the, the, this I wanted to, here's, here's Forster, Zetis, and of course Marilyn and Irving. Irving in, invited me afterwards uh, to come to, the, to, to, the, to this Institute for Advanced Study, 1992. It was one of the most happy times in my life, evenings filled with cinematic excursions, discussions with other fellows and Irving and Marilyn. It was only also one of the best times because, if my memory serves me correctly, I'm a soccer maniac, I was able to play soccer um, at the ground besides the buildings each day. So you see it, of course. Well, this, this is should be here. Last year, Irving wrote me an email that I should come back to, to Princeton soon for at least one reason. He wanted to fix a medal at one of the goal posts of the field with the inscription, this ground was changed into a soccer field by Horst Bredekamp in 1992. In, the, in this Princeton time, I worked on Romanesque uh, sculpture. One of the themes had been the continuation of antique forms 
like flying putty holding shields from both sides, like here on the Gelduinos altar in uh, the high altar in uh, Toulouse uh, Saint Sana. As you can see, we um, <laughs> performed what we had discussed in the most hilarious way, holding a portrait of Panofsky after we had. Yeah, uh, after we, and this is not unimportant, after we had discussed his founding text on iconology in front of the Kant Society in Kiel in 1931, where it becomes clear in this founding text of iconology that he did not sacrifice the form to the texts uh, of literature and philosophy, as sometimes uh, was put forward, but on the contrary, to defend the Gestalt against the method, method of Martin Heide Heidegger's rapidity of interpretation. One year later, and you heard that already, I, get a, I got a telephone call from Irving. Dear Horst, you promised Marilyn and me to explain us the Romanesque art and architecture of the Pyrenees. We will meet in one week, end quote. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the semester just had started, but I thought, well, a promise is a promise. <laughs> At the airport in Bilbao, no Marilyn and no Irving were, were to be seen, but another couple, which in the end I dared to ask, do you know the Levens? <laughs> the answer was yes, we'll meet them in Chaka. They are visiting the Altamira cave right now. I thought, OK. After, after an hour in the car, I found out that I was driving together with Frank and his wife, Berta, into the mountains towards Chaka, where the Levins were waiting for us already to visit the cathedral and its amazing sculptures. When I tried to explain the Dionysian uh, character of the capitals from the late 11th century, all of a sudden Frank started to dance in front of the col column, almost uh, singing, this is Ginger and Fred, the house which I'm doing in Prague. The story did not end there. I had to leave, but the, as I said, the semester was ongoing, but the others went on to Dijon where Irving showed Klaus Luther's tomb of Philip the Brave with the pleurant and the amazingly curved head coats. Frank was so amazed uh, by, uh, by these uh, shapes that he did a number of fantastic variations uh, of uh, sculptures, also models of uh, villas. Uh, after, um, an, uh, after other transformations, they ended up in the DG, DG Bank uh, next to the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. The internal, hall of this, the internal hall of this great building once again realized the headcloth of the morning monk in Dijon. Irving and myself both have written about this amazing story of historical actualization and the power of association and fantasy. I would like to end with an uh, object that combined all of us. In 2013, Irving and I met with James Ackerman in Paris in order to visit Frank, Frank's new Vuitton Museum in the Bois du Boulogne that was still under construction back then and write articles for the museum catalogues. Frank himself could not come because of an illness, but we three met walking around, stunned by this architecture, which for Irving made the Baroque of Benini and Borromini came to life in the frame of our own, of our, uh, own time. We each, as I said, wrote articles for the catalog, but weren't satisfied with the way the book had been realized. And so we, de we decided to make an autonomous contribution out of our three articles. <laughs> it, was Irving who <laughs> it was Irving who enthusiastically came up with the, with the idea to the special, very special title, and we agreed anonymously. 
I guess you have to read the book in order to get the joy the title, the title uh, evokes. Ro Frank wrote a superb preface. Even though the book just came out um, uh, recently, I, it missed Irving by just a few weeks. It is too sad, too sad that I alone present the book but I'm all the more happy I have two copies, the first two copies with me, and you can see I, I was uh, able, there was a pre-pre-copy uh, in occasion of the 90th birthday of Frank in Berlin where I could give him the pre-pre-book. <laughs> and I will give that with uh, all my thanks to Marilyn and Emilia and Sylvia. What Irving, in his greatness, meant for art history in the broadest sense and beyond, and maybe especially for the German-speaking Kunstgeschichte, I tried to express in an obituary in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung that, as I heard, will be uh, published together with other contributions in the journal um, uh, Artibus et Historia. The friendship that was binding the persons who spoke today and many more together and also me, one of the elements was that it was impossible to meet Irving and Marilyn in the way of small talk. In my case, each telephone call and each discussion became a power talk about history, Jewish German history, art history, methodology, and all kinds of uh, politics. But above uh, all, um, Irving and in the presence and also through Marilyn was for me a kind of, this is not translatable, väterlicher Freund. In this mood, dear Marilyn, also in the name of Kolja Torna, the editor, I would now give you this uh, book. And what I owe Irving and you, uh, it's much more than words can express. I thank you. Thank you all for these uh, lovely words. And I think now there's an opportunity if any of you feel to share some other experiences, words. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I'm Ellen Burstyn. I met Marilyn and Irving in Rome in 1968. That's 51 years ago. And we've been friends ever since. I am not part of the art world, I'm part of the theater world, but we knew each other. Our children were approximately the same age. We knew each other as mom and moms and dad. We went to the beach in Italy together with the kids. They've come to most of my openings. Um, we're friends. We, Irving and I have our birthday just a few days from each other, so we celebrated many birthdays together, as well as Thanksgivings and Christmas. They're like family to me. So the, I feel that the planet Earth lost two great souls at the beginning of this year, Irving Laven and the poet Mary Oliver. So I brought uh, Mary Oliver's poem to read. It seems Irving could have written it too. It's called When Death Comes. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what it's going to be like, that cottage of darkness. And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, 
as common as a field daisy and a singular, and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence, and each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Irving Laban wasn't a visitor to this world. He was an illuminator. It was an honor to know both of you, darling. Uh, I'm Jim Marrow, and uh, I've lived in Princeton since the early 90s, and I got to Princeton because of Irving. I was teaching at Berkeley, I forget where he, he came out, I think he gave some lectures on Picasso, and he said, why don't you come and visit the Institute, apply for next year, and I did. And I got here, and I found not just the intellectual community you've all spoken about, but a human community that Irving created, the likes of which I've not seen anywhere. I wanted to make some comments about Irving the human being. Irving welcomed one into his life in all of its dimensions. Uh, he took you in his heart. He bathed you with his affection. As I got here, and Irving later said, why don't you apply for this job at Princeton? And I did, with his encouragement and support, and ended up ending my at least academic, active academic teaching job here. <clears throat> Irving became one of the most powerful members of our family, in the, in the broadest sense of that word. We had four children from the time we moved here, first one born here, all four of them, and Irving appointed himself as Uncle Irving. And periodically, we would all go out together, the children, little children, with Irving in Maryland to a diner and share a meal, and he was Uncle Irving. Uh, all my children, none of whom could be here today, they're all busy and active and working, wanted me to say how much they missed and loved him and to share that with you. Uh, Irving was the best of humans. He created a sense of community, the likes of which I've not seen in any intellectual environment anywhere. Uh, not before him, as far as I know, at the Institute, not after him. He worked to create an all-inclusive sense of belonging, uh, which stretched beyond merely intellectual elements. Irving was a mensch in the best possible sense of that word. You could not know that man and spend time with him without loving him. Marilyn, you too, made that community. It was the two of you together always, and uh, there's nothing like it, absolutely precious. We love Irving, we miss him dearly. My children miss him. My wife, who can't be here, she's in Boston today, misses him. He was the greatest thing uh, in my intellectual life and any sense of community I've experienced in an academic environment anywhere. Thank you. I think one of the most, uh, I'm Ani Levine, <laughs> I'm the Professor Emeritus here at the Institute for Advanced Study. I think one of the real themes that came through today was Irving the teacher. And uh, Irving was my teacher here at the Institute. I'm a biologist. Uh, I came to start the biology program in the year 2001, 2002. And I showed up, and I was the only biologist here. And the first day I went to the dining room for lunch, because that's a real wonderful tradition here. And I looked around, and I began to realize that there was a table for each group. There was the physics table, the math table, the social science table, the history table. And each group had a table. And if I was to have a table, I would be the only one sitting at the table. <laughs> So uh, I thought I would try to be a little bit of an iconoclast here and break the tradition. So I went and I sat with the physicists for the first day. 
And I was excited by that because the physics is extraordinary here. And I thought the things I could learn would be spectacular. And I even spent the second day at the table. But on both days, I didn't understand the word that was being said at the table of the physicists. So I looked around, and there was the history table. And so I said, OK, I think I might be able to do this. And I knew there was a wonderful uh, historian of science, uh, Van Staten, who was here. And he studied medicine. So that was like biology. He studied medicines of Greeks in Alexandria, 200 BC. I thought this, this was going to be terrific. So I tried to worm my way into the history table to sit next to him. And I found myself opposite Irving. And from that moment in time, he became my teacher. Uh, I uh, was like so many young scientists. I was so dedicated to science that I only wanted to take science courses. Uh, by my third year of college, I worked in the lab all the time. Uh, and so I had an obligation, of course, to take uh, art history and music. That was part of the liberal arts education. And I wasted my obligation. I had a wonderful teacher, I have to say, of art history. He was a Kandinsky specialist. Um, and I think th that's the one thing I learned from the course was Kandinsky and, and not much else. And so I was totally unprepared for Irving and the kind of education the kind of teacher he was. It's been an extraordinary time for me because it's the, it's the quintessential thing about the Institute. You learn from each other, and it's a small faculty that you learn from. And so I'm uh, just ever, ever grateful for that first introduction. But it doesn't stop there. Uh, we uh, managed to raise some money and take the, bi the biology group grew. It grew to almost 15, 16 people. And we used to take uh, these young students, postdocs, young physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists, all over the world to, uh, for the summer, or for two weeks in the summer. And we picked great places to go. And in the morning, we did science. And in the afternoon, we toured the areas we were at. And we had decided to go to Rome. And we thought there would be no better people to teach us what Rome was about than Marilyn and Irving. And we invited them to come and join us in Rome for a week. And then uh, something strange ensued that I wasn't prepared for. Irving wanted me to understand that he was not a tour guide, that he was <laughs> a historian of art. And so if we needed to go places, we needed a tour guide. And he would come along, and he would help us. But he was not going to conduct the tours of Rome. So he said, OK, it's fine. So I think it was the first or the second day we were uh, visiting the papacy. And, and we came in, and we had a tour guide. So there's 15 of us. There's the tour guide. There's Mervyn and Marilyn along. And the tour guide starts off by pointing up to the balcony of one of the places and, and saying, say, that's where the pope was assassinated in 13, right? and on and on and on. And Irving stops her and says, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can imagine she was a little annoyed by, <laughs> by this, <laughs> but almost the two second stop or the third stop, right? Uh, he corrected her again. And then she began to see the depth which, which he understood <laughs> the history. <laughs> and the tour guide became Irvin. <laughs> and, uh, and the tour guide became one of us. <laughs> and, and, and off we went. But the, the highlight, the time I'll never forget, uh, was when we went to see Bernini's <laughs> sculptures in this wonderful house that was on the hill. And uh, that's when Irving caught fire. <laughs> he just, it just was spectacular. And I thought to myself, I should have been an art historian. <laughs> I, was, I, I lost it. <laughs> so it was just absolutely wonderful. And the final thing to say I owe Marilyn and Irving is the introduction of Frank Gehry, who has been here all day, sharing the day with us. Uh, we took the group that I told you about up to the Berkshire Mountains. We were going to listen to all the great music and go to the dances and so forth. In the Berkshires, in the morning, we had it. And, and, and Irving said, oh, my friend Frank Gehry is in New York, and he could come up and spend, spend some time. 
I said, that would be, that would be wonderful, right? And then I found out that Frank was going to give a talk. And I thought to myself, well, that, that would be a little strange for the group of biologists who had been physicists and so forth that Frank gave a talk. But then Irving really put it together. He said, no, you don't understand. You're going to give a talk, and Frank's giving a talk right after you. And you're going to talk about how, how biology builds people, how biology builds organisms. And Frank's going to talk about how people build spaces for the organisms to live in. <laughs> It's my teacher. <laughs> just, just an extraordinary time. And of course, those two lectures that balanced each other off, we found out that there were so many things in common, where biology builds organisms and the way people build buildings, and so many things to learn for the future that we explored, how organisms repair themselves. Why don't buildings repair themselves? Right? And, and a whole bunch of interesting comments. And so that evening, as we all, this is, this is the other second theme of the day, right? As we all sat on the porch after dinner and talked with a bottle of bourbon, I should say, right? <laughs> we, we invited <laughs> Frank and Berta to come to the Institute. And they came for a month here, right? And Frank has his doctorate from the Institute, from the biology department, because it's not official from the, <laughs> from the Institute, but he has his doctorate from the, from the biology department. And so the, the kinds of things Irving taught us all, because I think that's the theme that I've seen come throughout all of the talks. Uh, the teacher that he was, the depth at which he took us, the excitement that we all felt studying art history and architecture, uh, we owe to Irving and to Marilyn, and we're very grateful, Marilyn. <laughs>